And then honestly, it was a massively impressive. So Manhattan having that time to, you know, take a breath. And now they're going to be able to see what Kinesis will do. I think it's going to be more interesting to see how do you play against that, especially when you know they have a, such a strong player already in their setup. Yeah, well, Manhattan, they're going to be sending up Sans Man. And I haven't seen them this season yet. But Sans Man, if I remember, had switched over to the Aegis towards the end of last year. And they were... Frankly, doing a great job. So we'll be able to see how that... Oh, no, we're going over to the hero instead. That's going to be a tough one right here. As these spells, it's going to be tough as the aggressive pace of Miko Rising isn't going to give them a lot of pools. They've got to find a way to stuff them out or just get straight in there and stuff Ness out. I mean, extremely fair, but I mean, just look at how quick they are looking. Not really trying to use that MP for too much. They More than anything, it's just trying to set up for these combos. But Miko already putting up that aggression, making sure to use that PK fire for these setups, being able to eat out the sleep as well is already causing Sans to have to rethink the way they want to play, no longer going for full aggression, rather being onto that defensive, and even then Miko still is looking to push in. Ooh, and that was a nice punishment right there. Now you've taken the PK fire out of the equation, not gonna go off stage though, and not gonna throw out any projectiles either. You know that magnet is going to be out there, and here it doesn't really have the tools to go all the way out there and punish without a super hard read. Oh, it was a beautiful read, and then shutting down the attempting eat. You can't take anything when it comes down to the flame slash. So now Sans taking that stock lead. It's just more going to be looking on that defensive, being back, looking for these air strikes, solely just the build of that MP, and I respect it, though a little bit too predictable. Miko is getting used to it, now looking to just go in, be able to hit these air dashes, and, well, try to punish, but the problem is not finding any true security. The shields are coming out perfectly just to be able to defend against the PK fire. Anything truly to kill and the magic burst! Take yeah, that itself. was brutal. You could see the amazing punish and Miko rising for a second. They're like, uh-oh, this is probably bad. But now you're stuck off stage with no MP. They're going to get their landing caught out. But even with that, Sans and Man, a massive head up. And they were able to get the Kaboom too. They've got the Psych up as well. This could just be a kill if they get the right move. But instead, they just get shield pressure. Uh, it's definitely a problem, but not for too long because Miko able to get them off the edge, but not having too good of a guard at that moment. The Accelerate's going to allow just for more setup opportunities and especially combo similar uh, to that Greninja, especially when you use combo it with that Psych Up the Shield. Almost a one hit gets taken out. Unfortunately, Sans being caught lacking, going to be hit just by the Thunder Ooh. and comboed out of Oblivion. It's now one stock to stock. That was pretty much a zero to death user, as now this looks like Miko Rising could easily bring this back. They'll get their approach stuffed out as Sans Man. They're starting to eh, maybe tighten things up a little bit. They try to go for the reflect off stage. That was greedy, but hey, if it worked, it would have been a free kill. But when you're at such a low percent, I don't think you go for that. But you try to absorb the projectile, but not the explosion. As there we have it. Sans Man for Manhattan College getting an easy one point on the board and well i say easy that was hard fought i mean i actually just want to point out how dirty that was especially managing to catch them it gets absorbed oh, but not it. in yeah they stop it last second and Ooh. i mean the sizzle is going to take you out no matter what in that moment so just to hesitate and miss it out like right there that's so unfortunate on the head taking you out that's not good yeah, not good in the slightest as, ooh, obliteration right there. At, at times, this isn't something I normally see from hero players who, I mean, well, a lot of hero players, but honestly, perfect spacing on these aerials, like perfect spacing. Look at that, just the very tip of the hitbox every time. And it gives enough space where they have time to throw out a spell every time uh, Miko Rising tries to go in and punish. Like, you think of hero as some of the very slow laggy moves. But, yeah, I mean, there's no better stuffing out tool than that, uh, besides the fact, you know, RNG takes a bit to come out. <laughs> but besides that, there's not much better.
Yeah, I mean, even then, you still gotta give props, uh, especially when you're looking to use the very RNG-heavy hero. Uh, going in for those movesets, you, it takes a lot of, of just realization on what you might use, so to see it come out, especially with that magic burst, round two is gonna be even more interesting. Returning back to this pace of playing more mid, still having that charge, we do see Ness wanting to be a lot closer, not giving enough room towards their opponent, solely just to be able to get that setups. But once again, not being able to eat the sizzle, deja vu. It just happened and it will repeat it again. This is the early game that we saw from uh, Sansma Man last time. An aggressive melee blaze playstyle before they throw out the spells later in the game. If Miko Rising is able to get an opening now, maybe they'll have a chance, but still high MP is gonna give you a lot of tools to get out. Just a couple bread and butter fair chains. Sans my man doing a great job DIing out of any huge combos like they got caught with on their second stock last time. Yeah, beautiful eat though is going to help, especially when you're such at high percentage, you know, you're gonna want to get as much uh, health recovery as possible though. Still not being able to really walk in on Sans. Look at that beautiful aerial, just looking to try to set up, take this nest, but the grab is always gonna be that one weakness. Now you have to be extremely careful going on to the stage. It's almost like a soft dance. One person not wanting to make a misstep or that may cost them their stock, but Miko's the one consistently being thrown off the edge rather than Sans. And another scenario where you basically have to put everything into the recovery rather than being all the inventive. Oh, and with this psych up, it's like dancing with heels on right there. You are going to be in a world of hurt if you make one mistake. As now, look at this nice pressure on the ledge. Oh, they might run off and try and get the counter on the recovery. No, instead, they just, I mean, I, I appreciate that. Oh. Not overextending until you get your guaranteed kill with the side B. Uh, amazing poking tool right there. Goes longer than the side platforms. Just, and. I mean. Yeah, like, what point do you need to, you know, try and risk a kill when you know for a fact you can confirm it? Now, Miko is uh, very angry, as you can tell. Looking to use that PK Thunder. Unfortunately, gonna miss out and easily get punished, but still has enough time and health to look just play slow and take their time, especially with Sans being on that low MP. Gets countered kind of a little bit more predictable going out with these, uh, you know, electric slashes, but it doesn't leave Sans from still going in, still managing to get these strikes, get pulled, get grabbed now off the stage it's on such low MP. Thank goodness the zoom comes out to bring them back. That's the sign of a true hero, man. They go for the zoom, but they still had the chance to get out of there. Now they're going to get caught by the up smash of the shield, and that's kind of indicative. It's been a very grounded approach from Miko Rising this entire time, and that's going to be called out by the Kaboom. But if Santa Man doesn't catch on to the fact that they're getting grabbed a lot, it could be pretty painful. Oh, whack! Oh, I mean, Sans is just hoping that their opponent, Miko, just walks into the attacks. And, you know, a little bit of me, too. I would definitely like to see that happen. It'd be really funny. But still, I'm going to play very carefully, not wanting to waste that MP, but more than anything, not want wanting to just let Miko get these free hits and goes and gets the grab, throwing them off the edge, looking to get the guards. Fortunately, not going to be able to secure it for too much. Miko on a dangerous amount of health. Needs to respect them a little bit more, but still goes back in, gets the grab, and is saying, hey, please get off my stage. That would be really nice, but then the PK Thunder puts you in a very vulnerable spot. You get grabbed, and then slashed. Oh, that was dirty. Yeah, that flame slash right there, covering way more ground you could ever hope to cover. Now, underneath this platform, like you said, a little intricate dance is going to be played. They're going to get the back air right Oh, no! That's just unfortunate. Was not ready at all to just fall out of the up smash. Yeah, it looked like they were just looking to drop down solely to get back up and reset the invincible armor, but wasn't able to do it properly. Slams themselves down to the ground. Uh, now it's back to that one stock, one stock moment, and uh, both of these players had such even health. This is where we may see Sans look to be a little more rude. However, the combo set up, Miko thriving and able to get the back air. I mean, Sans is now on the back foot, not able to truly get this set up and is getting caught lacking due to Hero's own slow kind of, you know, anchor hits. But still, Sans is not over to lose it and is still looking to get that flame slash or hatchet, whatever is possible to help even the score. Yeah, and as they search for that, though, they're slowly running out of mana. The jab on shield is going to give you a little bit of options, but your reserves are running dry. But if you keep getting hit by these perfectly spaced aerials, you're going to give them everything they want. The spike puts Mikul in a panic. They need to get back to safety. But how are they going to do it now? Oh, they're going to roll right through that thunder this time. 
Yeah, but look at that. Getting hit with the VK Thunder. And it's a setup. And that is Sands being taken out, though, winning the first round. It seems Ness was more than ready to figure out the counterplay and did a wonderful job doing so. Yeah, that was truly fantastic. Miko Rising demonstrating that they are a master of the PK Thunder setups, popping you straight up. And you can see Sansa Man was actionable for like just a second, but they wouldn't need it to do pretty much an instant air dodge, and that could have been pretty easily covered by a drift back. Yeah. No, I definitely agree. And I mean, that's just unfortunate. Sans didn't even have the time to recover to you even try dodge. and dodge it. You can see this. They try to air dodge right here. And well, you had to DI out. You had yeah. to. Um, I mean, unfortunately, you just don't have that reaction. You know, the reaction sec, the frames just, I think, weren't in that favor, uh, though. Having the opportunity, I definitely feel could have put it in the favor. It's just Ness is always prepared to just go for those like quick kills off the edge. Yeah, and Miko Rising really does seem like the kind of player who may get stuffed out with these disjoints a lot of the time. They might rely on Ness's disjoints a little too much, but when the disjoints are enough to beat them in a straight up air to air they were struggling however once they like i said started playing a little more grounded going for drag downs going for tomahawks they're able to get the openings they need to get their massive punishes i mean i wasn't expecting to see a zero to death in the first set of the day but i mean we got that earlier and they're able to get these confirms too i mean it's an impressive showcasing as both sides already getting a singular point so that means when it comes down to the next round you know, we'll have to see who gets that best of third but uh, already I i'm in this weird spot where i'm looking at them both and i'm like they've seen how each other plays they know what they're gonna do well that realm of uh unknowing that you know the first round you get is no longer there and now i'm wondering who's gonna have that edge up yeah that's gonna be the tricky thing i feel like at first, it was definitely uh, Sansa Man completely dominating this neutral. They opened up the game, not feeding Ness any sort of uh, absorbs, and at low percents, even if they did, it wouldn't matter. And they're just mm -hmm. playing around the spacing, maintaining high MP, getting stage control. Once they have that stage control, that's when they start pulling out the spells. And the spells, I hate to say it, but they always do feel perfectly timed. Like, they do get the flame slash right when... Uh, Ness is trying to land just a little bit outside their threat range. They get the zoom when they need it and the kabooms. I mean, when you open the spell menu and don't use it all the time, it, it, it it's going to feel like you're abnormally lucky. But that's the kicker. They just don't use the spells every time they open it. Sometimes it's just a bait. They're like, come on in. And then they just stuff them out with an aerial. You know, as somebody who who is toyed around with hero i think it's incredibly hard not to just throw one out on panic or especially when you're in these high intensive moments that you misclick and you maybe hit that kamikaze and yet we saw perfect patience coming out and honestly that that very much helped when it came to the first and second set i think in the third that's definitely going to be one of the bigger points and i mean with a character like hero who has so many options Knowing the perfect spacing for that flame hatchet, that scares me, all right? I don't want to see what they do on their homework. They must know everything. And, well, I, I feel like a lot of it is just reliance on these low lag moves, and that is going to be their, well, bread and butter. The issue with Hero, S tier on paper, probably A tier, low A tier on in practice, because they have access to moves like Sizzle, like Flame Slash, like all these moves that are so fast, so deadly, but they don't always have access to them. So when you need to stuff out an approach and you go for that menu, if you don't get what you want, you're just going to get punished. And as we've seen, Miko Rising, when they get the hit they want, they hit like a truck, extending combos with the PK Thunder all the way to the bank. So we'll see if they're able to do that now. There is nothing people fear more than the unknown, and that's basically going up against Sans. I mean, already looking to use that Sizz. Unfortunately, gets caught out by the PK Fire, having to play on the edge. Almost, ooh, that was a little bit scary. On Holds on the Kamikaze, tried to bait in, but Mika, more than prepared, wants to go for that edge guard, but not going to be able to uh, cleanly hold it out. I'm just more impressed at the Flames. They're going in, they're looking for the setup, now having the bounce. Miko's getting a little bit too, you know, overwhelmed by all the spam. 
This is a change of pace from last time. Before, like I said, they would not go for the spells, but then with the psych up, they're able to finish Miko rising shockingly early. 92% from the center of the stage. Come on, man. And now you get the anti-air right there, covering the entire platform with that up tilt. They've got Miko rising in a box. Uh, you know, this is definitely looking like the hero play that we sort of expected. Definitely putting in that aggression, forcing that Ness into the worst spots. And that's a back-to-back -back looking to just do that damage, rack it up at 115. I mean, poor Miko wants to try to eat as much of, of it that is mobile. But unfortunately, it, they're just not being able to predict or kind of guess when it's coming out. It's becoming the issue, though having that space, looking to just neutral fight this with the PK, definitely having to just slow down and respect the attacks, but almost gives their opponent a free ride back. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like Sansom Man has been hit by the other hitbox of that every time and sent out diagonally. This time, though, they get pulled in and they were not ready to tech. But with a medium charge thunder, they're going to be able to even up the... Oh, wait, no. Maintain their lead, my bad. As you can see, they're just playing around this grounded movement. That PK fire pretty presumptuous, but hey, I'm not judging. I agree. Judging is not what I'm here for. Rather, I'm more interested... With the usage of the MP, that kaboom lands, dropped the shield a little too early, and then gets punished from it. Now Miko is just looking to go for these grabs. Definitely just wants to try to win this out due to Hero's own recovery messing up at times. However, that is not going to be the case. I mean, just managing to get that slash goes with the bounce, throws you on the side. You've got to go for that risk, but not wanting to attempt it. That's definitely respectable. Though Miko doesn't really have that room. Has to just try to go for these high intensive plays. But that's a punish you don't want to have it. That's going to be tough. And with that, two more points on the board and add another two for your victory. As Sansa Man gives Manhattan College an early lead right now. And I have to say, against Caduceus, I was not expecting this. They've got... Uh, well, Kanishas has been a very tough opponent for quite a few people. And though they're not the highest of high tiers, they've been impressive. So with Manhattan College being able to open this strong against a player who was the anchor last week, good things to come. You know, there's always times that change. And this is why I always tell people, be confident in your play. There is always a time to make a difference. And I got to say, that was a big point it, maybe just you know playing on wi-fi has taught the usage of just perfect spacing and i mean just like in that moment you see the reaction understanding that miko's going in for these hits and then immediately just goes with the same move of just the thunder hit and while miko yes did want to try and go for that pk thunder very high risk move he didn't have too much to lose eventually that was what's going to cost and i think we can now can understand why we saw manhattan not really go for those you know intensive you know spikes or anything very early on but once it got to that third set they immediately said you know what i'm going for it and it it worked with the mp at least yeah, with the MP, they eventually come out on top. Fantastic coverage a lot of the time. They had bounced what felt like up the entire time. But what I do want to call out is I do not blame Miko Rising for going for that PK Thunder. Like, put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. You're down two stocks to one. You're there at like 50%. Your only chance is to steal this stock and get an amazing zero to death. How else are you going to do that without the PK Thunder? You need to get an edge guard of some kind, maybe some up B uh, shenanigans, but that hasn't really been working in your favor. You have to go for something big. So they went for it. It didn't pan out. That gamble going to turn up on the wrong color. And now your team is down against uh, Manhattan College. Now Manhattan looking to maintain their lead, getting right in. And ooh, I, we might have some uh, new players. I... I have no idea who this is. It's a long name and it's going to take me. Okay, hold on. Yohomi <laughs> Nicholas. Oh my. Okay. I can't read. It's Yohomi Nicholas. That's why you have that underscores in your name like I do. You'll be able to perfectly read it every time. Mm hmm. Yeah, for sure. Is. Yeah, let me just check where in the standings they are. Yeah, so they're both around the middle of the pack, but Kanishas has definitely had a leg up over Manhattan as of late. However, we're in a new season. We've had a whole break, and these teams are finally getting warmed up and getting right back into it. Manhattan looking to claw their way up these rankings to make their way into the playoffs in the later, uh, later parts of spring. Kanishas 
all they need to do is maintain this spot but it's not going to be easy with this new talent up and coming we'll see if they're able to get it out okay we're getting a little bit of a button check now Whoa. I, yeah, that button check is going to be very important, but, uh, you know, I'm highly interested. I feel there's always that realm of, like, curiosity when we see someone that name we don't instantly recognize because that's someone who may come out with something crazy. You know, maybe a DK player, maybe a game and watch. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, and I have to say, Miko Rising was one of the new spring players for Can uh, Kanisha's College. So... It's not like just because they're coming in this late in the season, they are not good. You saw how well uh, Miko Rising kept up the offensive for the longest time before eventually being beaten out by Sansma Man. We'll see if they're able to keep that up here and now. Um, Yeah, I'm trying to see. Oh, it's Flapjack. Anytime the captain goes in and they're the one calling the shots, I always get so tripped up. But yeah, with Flapjack coming in, that'll be interesting. They... They want to get back this lead. They want to get a lead. And with their amazing Crom play from what I saw last time, chunking through stocks again and again and again, I have to assume we've got some big stuff over the horizon. I just highly uh, agree with that. I mean, Crom is by far one of my most favorite characters. And it's just solely all the things that people can hit at times, especially when your main priority is to go for these kind of back hits. You want to try and optimize as much of, of kind of that long mid-range damage, however you kind of put it. Uh, and that's what these players do. So you, you sometimes get some wicked setups that I, I think, I, at least yeah. I'm not used to, you know? Oh no, I completely understand. Krom is deadly. Goes across the stage slightly more range than Roy, but that does it's not as big of a factor. The main thing is consistency. Krom is consistent damage over and over and over again. You get hit by one tiny pixel of that jab, it's going to be brutal. The issue is, the issue is, the one place Krom is not consistent is the edge guards. If you're against a count or a character with a counter, Krom really doesn't have that many options. It's not like Ike who can go up for a high recovery. No, Krom has mainly the one option to get back to stage if you take his other resources. So if you're able to exploit Flapjack off stage like that, uh, well, your homie Nicholas might be able to get some mileage, but this is the captain for a reason. Flapjack is coming in here to make up this point differential. You know, you, you always got to have pride in the captain, especially when they see one of their players go really toe-to-toe -to -toe and still lose out. They're going to say, hey, you know what? Pulling up my pants, I'm putting on the overalls, and I'm going farming because I'm about to get some points, all right? That's at least what I'm going to be seeing. Uh, though I highly agree. I feel that's always the risk players go with when they choose Krom. It's similar, like, in that sense of just Little Mac. You may not have the best recover or best way to stop your opponents from getting back on the stage, but look on the bright side, you're gonna have consistent damage. You're going up a character like, like King DDD. It's almost an ironic counter, just being able to have that air suck and knock you off, but we're gonna be seeing this go into just some basic setups, basic combos, using the Gordo solely just to knock them off already at 48. I mean, Flapjack has to just respect the King DDD, but still go in for these moves if they want a chance to kind of break through. Yeah, the overwhelming and the punishes with the uppy. Those are the two things I've got my eyes on. Krom has the momentum and the speed to run right into that forward smash. Because when you have that momentum, when you have that speed, you have to be aware that people are going to be putting roadblocks in your path. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just, uh, your homie Nicholas managed to get the beautiful parry. And I gotta say, that's an even more impressive parry on to the Gordo. But, you know, this is one of the moments where we're talking about not being able to get that edge guard now at 15%. And unfortunately, you know, Nicholas is going to be able to get a lot more spacing done or any opportunity just to be able to stop. And with, you know, being at the wrong angle, you don't immediately get that smash kill. Though, still having the confidence to go onto the edge proving a statement that both sides can take a sock if they need to. Yeah, and now Flapjack, that was their wake-up call. That was their splash of cold water in the morning. Now they're getting in. They're putting a lot of pressure on. Because when you put all these buttons on top of DDD, the nares, the forward airs, the jabs, there's not a lot the king can do about it. As you can see, they try to go in the air-to-air -air and they just get beaten out by these cleaves. 
Oh, even just with the back air knocking King DDD. I mean, the characters cannot keep up with the speed, though being able to knock off the stage. That's really all they can do, and that's not very often. Just like in that scenario, going for the back air, just looking to kill off. Nicholas can get back on the stage as much as they want, but the problem comes into securing, though they can kill much faster. Flapjack has been able to just kind of land up going with the up there. And now, though that Gora does make up for any form of mistakes that would have been made, it's the hammer kill that finishes off, not blocking nor being able to counter fast enough. And that's the, like, Wi-Fi special, where you're trying to maybe get something else, but, okay, they're able to even out the stocks, but just standing still or committing to a dash, <laughs> they're two polar opposites, but they both leave you a little bit more vulnerable than you would expect. As there, ooh, they're able to finish up this. Can they just keep this DDD off stage? Yes, one more they can, they off. I think that was it. If they didn't make it back, they would have just barely made it back, but that board air is going to be the finisher right there. Crom able to take it in the end. Flapjack a little more dicey than they would have hoped, but in the end, I feel like Flapjack had the control the entire time. You know, I want, I kind of want to agree on that, though. I feel Nicholas was, was at least doing a good job when he came back into the recovery, though did get punished a lot. Felt like a big fight when it came to, uh, to just understanding, getting a sense of how Flapjack was going to work. So, you know, I think Nicholas, as we go into more of the second round, is going to get that sense of, hey, maybe I can get away with doing this more. I got punished a lot for doing that. And, you know, it's going to gain pure control rather than a hypothetical of just, you know, feel they're getting that control. Yeah, your homie Nicholas, they really remind me of just going for oof, the, right there. Hard, hard oh. punishes. It's like they see how powerful Flapjack is, but they also see the, cla the cracks slowly forming in their game plan. So even though the game plan is looking very nice, they still know that they want to push buttons. They want to push them a lot. And they're not going to hold shield. They want to beat you out. You go for a slow option. They're not going to wait till it's over. They're going to go and beat the living daylights out of you. And that yeah, works. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I mean, what? This game costs $60 plus DLC. Who's, pet, who's buying it to play defensive? I think uh, Flapjack's already showing that they're playing this game slowly to go in and using the side stage very beautifully not something we see too often but with the same matchup i am not expecting the same outcome for too long especially when that stage gets a little bit of a switch and we go over to a stadium x and y may not have been a good game but this is an amazing match still these similar setups coming in. Beautiful grab with the up air, hoping to just kind of get in that chip damage until still though, putting on that patience does not get punished with the hammer. Oh, and now you have the king off stage. They're just going for ledge traps though. Krom has a lot of options, baiting a roll in, and they go all the way off just to get that forward air. Now, you gotta be mindful of that super armor, and I think Flapjack's not gonna make that mistake twice, but either way, it's just more damage. This time, the uppie's gonna be punished, but DDD with a forward tilt, not a ton of combos from that. And the jabs providing constant pressure on the shield. Look at this, that jab, probably one of the best spacing tools, the best ledge trapping tools in the game. Is that up smash gonna be punished by the uppie? Not gonna kill quite yet, you're not like. Oh, that will. It's just unfortunate as Nicholas is losing more and more ground when it comes down to these fights. I mean, even hitting the Goron into the DDD, that's not something a lot of people do, often just ignoring it. And Flapjack just wants to go for this guard, wants to try and stop, even going solely to try and spike. May not be able to land it out, but at 75, uh, Nicholas is forced to try to just get them off the edge and then zone them for as much as possible. And that's the best strategy that you're gonna have because Chrome just does not have the recovery for those moments. And that's how you're gonna easily bring the sock back up. But then Flapjack says, that was dirty. I can be even dirtier and is already looking to shut them down but at least the down slam is going to have that knockback for a little longer and give a bit more time to get a, a bit more percentage and this right here is the benefit of just shutting them down like 
Honestly, Flapjack, if they perfected their game plan, there really is nothing that King DDD could do. It doesn't matter that your homie Nicholas is punishing them as, oh, there we go. You punish that inhale. As soon as the end lag comes out, there it is. There, they wait for the end lag instead of going for the immediate punish. That's what we need to be seeing. And that's what has been the theme of this game. Flapjack cleaning up their game plan and they're looking to get the two stock right here. Your homie Nicholas, Nicholas, are they able to put a stop to it? I mean, N Nicholas is panicking at this point, not even wanting to move away from this edge, almost just looking for these grabs and, you know, forcing Flapjack to have to play a little bit more risky. And yet Flapjack is ready to play against it and shut it down at all points. I mean, luckily the Gora uh, Gordo stops, you know, Flapjack from being able to jump in and eventually is going to knock them far, but it's not really going to be able to confirm much. Nicholas is stuck in this point where the jabs are too quick, where you can't block them, so you have to try and parry, but if you parry, you know, then you run that risk and, well, you're just hoping for one big down smash here. Ooh. The up smash will put it down to a last stock scenario. I've seen DDD steal stocks before, but with the pace Flapjack is playing at, I'm not sure it's going to be happening, user, as... They get the ledge trapping online. They're going for this forward tilt a lot, and even though it does cover roll away, they're still able to get the shield out in time. Now you're being juggled by King DDD. The backer will send you off stage, but you do have super armor on that recovery. You'll probably make it back to ledge. Getting off of it, though, against Krom. <sighs> Hold your breath. Having to be extremely careful. Just gets hit by the simple move. One good back air. That's all it will take. And look at that, not even needing it. That was just a beautiful slash and Flapjack just had the percentage in their percent, getting that advantage long in the series, managing to take the win. And that was hard fought and it's only going to be a tie in the end, but you really did need that tie. As now, you put your team on good footing towards the end. There, that was nice. You've noticed that they jump off that platform anytime they go up there. They like to be up high in the air. DDD, honestly, I don't think a lot of characters like to be above their opponents, but DDD's like doesn't dislike it. With one of the fastest falling speeds in the game and aerials that are a little bit disjointed, you can get a lot of mileage from up there. But if you're consistent with going up there, Krom being able to jump right up there with the back air is gonna be a nice read. And again, here's just the overwhelming I was talking about. A lot of these moves, if they hit your shield, Krom is more or less an advantage against DDD because what's DDD's fastest option? Maybe shield grab? There's not a lot there. Yeah, uh, and it's an unfortunate fact too that it almost basically became like a script uh, of just how the DDD had to get back onto the stage. I definitely felt that what made it really easy uh, for Jack to confirm a lot of these kills. They knew what was going to happen, and, you know, I definitely feel that once you get that read on your opponent, that can basically mean the end in the long term. Yeah, and Flapjack right there. The thing I noticed about them is Flapjack seems to be the kind of player who doesn't give their opponent a lot of chances to punish mistakes because they keep them in disadvantage the entire time. Now, disadvantage, uh -huh. that's any time you're being comboed, but it's also just when you're in a bad position, when you're on platform above your opponent, when you're trying to get off ledge, you are in disadvantage, and that's where Flapjack loves to keep you. Meanwhile, it feels like a uh, homie over there, they only really got any sort of reward off of the mistakes from Flapjack, and that's not a bad way to play. Punishing mistakes... Well, <laughs> every single player does it, but when you rely yeah. on the, exclusively on that with big heavy options like forward smash, then all your opponent needs to do is tighten up their game plan, and then suddenly the one opening you were getting has evaporated. And I absolutely agree, and even then, you know, uh, players who do rely on that often play, I, I think people with a lot more counters to where you can more get those setups or even that incineroar who can just get massive damage off similar to a king ddd i think flapjack just you know not the person who's going to make the same mistake three times over second time maybe that that's happened but three times no 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 you've gone silly yeah you certainly have is going up into the next match we're gonna have crimson coming out I believe they're the captain of Manhattan, and beyond that, they play a pretty obscure character. They're going to be coming out on the Kirby, and all you at home, you might be thinking, why is he Kirby all the time? In competitive play, he's not quite as common. He's 
he struggles a lot in any aerial situation and in a game that's all about spacing aerials on shield like as your bread and butter kirby can struggle but with an amazing ground game with a pretty good uh anti-air up tilt a down tilt for poking you're going to get some potential and against specifically Weebson who's coming in here on the dark pit or maybe the wee brawler or the me brawler i think you're not going to be as worried about the air to airs i mean dark pit does have the disjoints but even if they don't i like their ground game isn't the best <laughs> you know you make a a great point when it comes down to that ground game versus the air game I, I definitely feel kirby doesn't thrive on it uh unlike you know a debatably a character like jigglypuff or anybody else and it's understandable so but when it comes down to that end game i mean half a dark pits utility is just not going to be working as well especially when electro shock is a once it you know you spam it too much or you use it it has a very big punish window that i feel a, a character like kirby easily can get away with and i think that's definitely going to be the more uh the more interesting setup is how do you get a lot of value out of the dark pit kirby's going to have enough of a recovery and simple floats to be able to dodge your arrows uh, electro shock is a big move but you know somewhat a little obvious compared to you know the regular pit that down the yeah. ground game i think is going to be by far the most important part yeah you're dead on right there and you do call it the electro shock I feel like that might be a good uh, kill move towards the ledge. I'm trying to remember what the difference is. Um, but on Dark Pit, I believe it does send out. And with Kirby having a lot of yeah. trouble getting off of ledge, I mean, he does have multiple jumps. He does have multiple jumps, which makes it good to stall out your recovery. But Kirby, in the long run, is actually a pretty easy character to edge guard. And Dark Pit also having a multiple jumps, if you're just able to get out there and use your disjoints to make sure Kirby can never touch the stage before those five jumps run out, then they're going to be in a world of hurt because forced to rely on that up B, oh, that's hard. I absolutely agree. And, you know, one of the more benefits of Dark Pit, I, I definitely feel, is going into that arrow uh, because there are the big differences of why players prefer Dark Pit over the Natural Pit. And maybe that's because Electro Shock gives you a little bit of super armor. So, you know, if Kirby's running at you, hits that attack, going for the Flaming Sphere, always forget what they call it. You're just Electro Shock. So it's always going to be a game of who runs that risky move who's going to do something very obvious and then possibly get punished for it yeah and i'm i'm interested to see the punish game that'll be coming out here because that is the real kicker kirby does have some punishes but they are not easy not by a long shot but even if you're able to hit a couple dare loops you're still able to uh well rack up the damage that kirby can sometimes sorely lack as now you get the opening with the down tilt into the dash tech okay this is the punish game that i was talking about you're absolutely right. This is more the hypotheticals that we were paying attention to. That arrow not going to do too much. Look at that beautiful up air bringing Crimson back into the field. Weepson, though, wanting to play more inside this air. The Electro Shock not going to be able to have that armor up fast enough, though, getting back the edge guard. Puts himself in a bad position to be up hit, but not smashed out. Still in a dangerous spot to where they're the ones having to engage back onto the point, using the arrow solely for spacing, wanting Crimson to just use as much of their mobility very early on solely so they can go for a big kill. Unfortunately, Kirby is going to be having these quicker hits just to be able to edge it out, but Electro Shock does make the difference. Yeah, beautiful trade on out there, and it is going to be the Pip forward throw to get the finisher. Kirby, a light little lad, but they're able to get that forward smash right there. That little poke is going to be enough. But at the moment, what I'm seeing is even though Crimson, they get a big opening at lower percent. Oh, wait, oh, if they get the two frame right here, this could be a big setup. No, they're not able to finish it up, but they still get 36% off of that interaction. I mean, even then, you're making your opponent sweat a little, maybe not wanting to play on that edge, and they're going to have to kind of switch up their style, though I like the fact that Crimson is using Kirby, one of Kirby's biggest factors, being small. Just be able to dodge those standard setup combos, though. We've sent going in. Ariel tries to hit the arrow, and Kirby just has so many deterrents stopping you from going for that edge guard, which we've sent is hungry for wanting to try and shut down. But I think that's Crimson's bright side, just looking for the setups and is ready to smash or at least look to punish. But look at that. That's what makes Electro Shock so strong. The super armor powers through it. 
Yeah. And that's what Crimson is going to receive for doing a lot of aerials in place. Not stuffing out anything preemptively. Weepson is going to catch on to that. Now, there's something doing something preemptively. Landing with that forward tilt or forward air is going to be punished by the smash attack. Now, trying to recover here. Get off ledge. Where does Crimson go? Oh, they go for a high recovery. You don't see that from Kirby often. I, I agree. And, you know, that's just solely from the risk. But being at a high percentage of simple back air is all it takes to send Crimson back to the Shadow Realm. And now, similar to how it's been all day, stock per stock. And yet, Weebson is the one setting themselves up for the advantage. And then Crimson just says, nope, gonna start just floating in the air, get some simple jabs and look to play around you. That Electroshock eventually being punished, just being thrown out at the wrong time. Though the shield at least gives you a bit more room to breathe, Weebson is not finding any room to play anymore. The reprieve wasn't enough though. Even though Weebson is get the advantage, ooh, they're actually able to put them off stage again. This is crucial, but they're not ready for that projectile right there. Now Crimson is going to be floating back. Careless, ooh. Careless as can be, they're able to just barely make it back there. I was scared for them, but overusing that shield, oh, the Ford Smash punishes have been how uh, Crimson has gotten all of their kills. You do one thing wrong, they are darting towards you with menacing aura. That that gave me a shiver me timbers type of moment. My my anxiety uh, just rose on that point because I mean the shield was there. Weepson felt a little bit confident but a little fun fact you get a hit if it's underneath or on top of you and even then Weepson drops it at the last second and crimson just says psych allied takes you out kicks you dead in the joint not even in the leg in the stratosphere and i mean takes the win off of it and it was a pretty similar fight throughout this and though we said that brown game was going to be very important i feel like both of the, both players spent their time mostly in the air. Yeah, and oddly enough, it felt like Crimson was in their element when they were on top of Weebson. When they tried to stuff out approaches, uh, when they tried to like do an aerial in place and hope they've run into it, like that isn't gonna work against Pit. And you can see Crimson starting to catch on to that towards the end. Because if you try and do that, you're going to be met with A, a disjoint, or B, even worse, an electroshock. You're absolutely right. Now when it comes down to the next round, it's just going to be a big breathing moment. And I mean, Weepson is not going to look to let their team comes in to help take back that lead. Ties up the series. Now it's going to be looking absolutely angry however i'm more interested to see what type of different usages will be there definitely a bit more i think reluctant to use that arrow solely because the arrow isn't going to be getting too much value against that kirby i just feel crimson uh maybe this is where you start hoping their controller gets drift <laughs> speaking of uh advantages against kirby or disadvantages rather you brought up the size one thing you got to keep an eye on throughout this entire fight is how not having a strong punish game on small floaty characters is going to be so detrimental when you can only get like 30% off an interaction as most. At most, it's going to be so brutal. You have to rely almost entirely on neutral wins, whereas Crimson, they are looking for the kill every time they get an opening on you. Not able to get a follow-up off that up till that time. Weebson with good sort of a DI down and just shielding immediately, knowing Kirby doesn't have a lot to do off of that. Absolutely agree, but still wanting to get the small chip damage and unfortunately gets hit with the side and Just barely the electroshock is going to allow them to get on stage, but they almost take no they take the dark pit a Beautiful guard edge to stop and now crimson looks agitated is going in saying hey, give me back the sock You were supposed to fall with me <laughs> Yeah, no the ledge gonna interrupt that and now Crimson has this little lead they're playing with. Kirby having trouble getting off ledge as expected, but able to get the opener off of that down air. The down air has been the name of the game this time. Oh, and the trip off the down tilt too is another amazing opening. Now you've got them at ledge. Goes for a hard read, and I don't even blame you for doing it. It would have put them in a juggle situation. I agree now though. Kirby very much is trying to get away without recovery. Unfortunately, Ooh. does not count the jumps enough. Didn't have a moment to get it back. And, well, 
you kind of punish yourself in that scenario, but at least you put yourself back into that zero percentage. You're going to be able to play up against Weepson, and well, you're just going straight forward, but this is the benefits when it comes down to Dark Pit, having a little bit more range in these scenarios, but I mean, Crimson gets the parry, looks to kind of juke around, but now is getting edge guard. It may get smashed off the side. No, just barely makes it back. Weepson has to be careful. Sometimes Dark Pit just plays like Jigglypuff, I will say, just carrying you way off the stage like that. Luckily, Crimson had saved their jumps, and now they're able to just space that forward air on shield, but it's still not enough. Pit Swords have a surprising amount of destroy, and at least against a character like Kirby. Now, though, spacing outside the range of that Electroshock, you're going to be able to get a little bit of damage. Ooh, what was that? Did they get pushback off of the shield? They went flying! <laughs> I'd like to think it was a little bit of both, you know, maybe the Demon Slayer coming out, but that parry, not enough to save you from that damage, though I do like the arrows being a big point, but a beautiful down smash. I mean, that's not a tactic that you see often work just because the recovery, but Crimson is more than ready to show it. Mm. However, Weepson is always looking to even it up the moment it gets traded. Not quite the spe sweet spot you were looking for, but here's these Kirby bread and butters. You get the 45%. Now, ooh, that down or down smash looking to cover a roll in, but it's not going to manifest. Instead, Weepson is going to be going way off stage, trying to stuff you up, but you're forced to do a low recovery. Nice delay, though, on that to avoid getting down aired once again. I agree. Now, with both of them being so even, the faster person is going to look to just try and take up as much damage as possible, though. Good up smash just to try to talk in, and that's one of the points I said! You get hit if the shield gets is on the bottom, and, well, the arrows just aren't going to be doing too much. We've sent looks for that parry, manages to land it out, and they're, they're adding mid-distance. One good smash can cost it all, and, well, with Crimson knocking Weepson off the stage, getting the grab and throwing them in the sky. Well... It's not going to be looking good. Using these little empty hops again and again and again to bait out that. <gasps> but they actually survive right there from center stage. Okay, they're able to stay in it. But they've been using these empty hops. But this time, the overshoot gets the oh. damage you need. Oh. Weebson able to finish oh. off Crimson right there. I was literally in the middle of trying to compliment how Crimson was using little empty hops to avoid that... Uh, Buster right there and then immediately come out for the punish, but they're not drifting far enough back on their aerials like they were earlier. And well, I think we can give more credit to Weepson for positioning a just a little bit closer to Crimson once they notice ah, everything's seeming to just whiff out of nowhere. You know, when we're in these high intensive moments, the biggest thing that can happen is a mistake. It's so common with even the top players. I think Crimson just suffered from a little bit of stressonitis and, well, did not manage to clean it out, both even on the sides. And that was such a beautiful guard, honestly. I'm a little yeah. jealous. That's just what you need to do, though. Pit, one of the more exploitable recoveries in the entire game. Like, we talked about Kirby's, but Pit's, even though it goes a far distance and you've got multiple jumps, once you start that up B, it is just a linear line all the way to the ledge where you want to be. So if you have a lingering hitbox, like, say, a really long-lasting spike like that, or just throw down the rock, too. If As long as you put something in between Pit and the ledge somewhere, he's probably gonna get spiked. And even though he'll be able to come back from it, if you're like Kirby able to linger out by the ledge, you can maybe get a little more as, oh, that was untackable too, brutal. Uh, if there's anything I hate more is not being able to, you know, counter out against my opponent. But I mean, it's just the unfortunate fact that you just put yourself inside that position. Now with everything being tied up, I'm curious. These players are more even than I think we truly expected starting out. You know, Kinesis, one of those teams where we've had a lot of high moments, so the confidence goes in when we see them. But they've been put on the back foot. They're playing at a standstill rather than getting the edge more often than not than we're used to. Yeah, and I mean... Picking up the pace of the game is very hard when you're at a deficit like this. When you're, especially when you just lost the game, I feel like Crimson was starting to pick things up just a little bit in the middle of that. They were really smothering Weebson, but 
as soon as Weebson was able to begin getting the proper spacing and calling out preemptive aerials with that electroshock, that's when things started to get a little dicey. And also towards the end there, the double electroshock too, the worst, uh -huh. <laughs> the one thing they will never expect is to pick your most obvious option twice. <laughs> You know, more than anything, I think the biggest option is just to go in beast mode. I mean, look at this. They're both fighting on the edge, no longer even wanting to play on the stage just to make sure that somebody gets hit. Crimson getting some beautiful counters. Doesn't manage to grab the ledge just barely at the end, going to hit it. But if they got knocked, that could have been looking very bad. The Weepson is very angry now, taking the space and, well, going in for it. But Crimson is getting more out of it than anything. Yeah, they are. As get the up smash into the up air. That up smash is surprisingly a good combo tool, but either way, uh -huh. it's not going to do much to help you ledge trap right there. The forward tilt will, though. That forward tilt, a nice little poking tool that they've been using again and again, but they tried to get the juggle situation again against Kirby. Instead, though, they've realized the disjoints are their friend. The swords are your friend. I agree, but I mean, that's a good moment. You force Crimson to have to shield the moment that you get back on stage, so you get a little bit more breathing room, but just barely. After you get hit, you manage to come back down. Crimson is still not allowing you to get back on the stage, and you know, that electro shock could possibly help, but they really don't want to run that risk. Don't want it to be a little too obvious, and more than anything, getting the ship damage is helping a lot because as that back air manages to come out, Weepson is going into this fight against a Crimson who's at 56%. The Kirby is stuck playing on these edges. Oh, but every single time, Crimson able to get this consistent damage that Weebson has to struggle a little harder for might make a difference in the long run as long as, yeah, you get the disjoint on your uh, recovery to at least get back to stage. But now you've got to deal with the Barrage of Errors. But going off stage like that against Kirby, oh, that was presumptuous. They're able to just barely get back there. <gasps> Crimson wants that spike they got earlier so bad, but this time Weebson has the correct DI. It is getting very intense. The up smash does give some room, but look at that. As you recover back on, the electroshock almost puts themselves at a bad spot, but just barely giving them some room. Crimson is looking to juggle as if they're playing Mario. However, this is Kirby, a very interesting character and one who is ready to just jump through. I mean, just notice how they go in for these shields and these quick jumps. Eventually, somebody's going to get punished, and it seems that it's Crimson at this high percentage. But now Weebson is on that big disadvantage, and we've seen it once. We've seen it twice. The moment one player gets low and gets taken out, somehow they get punished immediately after. That's what Weebson is trying to avoid right now. But either way, Crimson with the up smash lands it cleanly playing around that a uh, low profile and now you've got the dare rides as well these low commitment options have been so good for kirby and even though that down air can be punished if it doesn't hit they're right on top of them now the new using the down air for confirms as well all you need need to do is keep putting weeps in off stage like that where they need to commit to a big option to get back on the electro shock looking to just be a bit of careful but look at that crimson Putting in that pressure on the side, then goes in, gets that quick hit. Weepson needs to be a little careful, but the spin! That's all Crimson needed. They've got the dance move for days, and it seems at 38%, gonna be able to land and take that victory. Incredibly stressful for both of these players. Yeah, Kirby spinning around like a pizza, flatten them, flattening themselves out so they can't really be hit. I think they went for a landing forward air right here, but oh, with the, it was the Nair. But either way, it's not going to have the landing hitbox you need because Crimson played low and slow. Just look at this. They either, they just duck under almost all of the options that come out. And when they do get caught out, you know where it is? In the air. Anytime they go in the air, it's Weebson who has the advantage. But when Kirby is low to the ground like that, avoiding your grabs, avoiding your landing aerials, and most crucially getting down smashes and down tilts that trip you up and then set you up for the kill. You know, I gotta be honest. I don't think I'm, I've ever been this, uh, you know, more interested to see the matchup and how close it was going in. Uh, a lot of the fights often in Smash Bros takes place on this ground, but to see it, you know, take place not only on the ground, but in the air, more in the mid side, and each player basically punishing themselves over their character's weakness, 
That's pure smash right there. You know it is. You know it is. Playing around those weaknesses, that's the kicker. I feel like Crimson, well, they got a little bit of a reward early on for playing in the air. I mean, you get the down throw forward air combos that Kirby is so well known for. But more than that, they were able to drift out with little empty lands, which that's when you just jump up and you land without throwing out any aerial. You have no lag, more or less. That is what they were doing most of the time, and they were getting punishes off of it. But once we Weepson started to space around those, then you couldn't be getting caught in the air like that. So what you need to do is change your game plan completely going into the last stock. I don't know if it was gradual and they just slowly started doing it, but the last stock is where it really became obvious. It, there were like three or four separate moments where it looked like Weebson was going to get the openings that we saw, the neutral wins that we saw with those disjoints, with those swords that can't be hit. But instead, the swords went right over Kirby's head and Kirby would get a down tilt, which has a chance to trip you. And once you're tripped like that, it's like being hit by a banana peel. You're knocked on your butt and you have to pick an option or you don't get a chance to pick an option because, uh, Crimson is almost always ready to just immediately throw out a dash attack. They understood their character, they understood the game plan that they had to stick to towards the end, and having the right game plan right in that clutch situation, often that's the most important thing. I mean, you said it way better than I ever could, you know, exquisitely attempt to say, because I had to use the word exquisitely just to make it sound a little bit more fancy. <laughs> However, Manhattan are definitely going to be feeling proud of that victory. Nonetheless, putting themselves a little bit further into a chance of solidifying a victory. But I mean, that was roughly the third match. So I definitely feel Kinesis, they're only going to be getting a more motivated as it goes on. But I'm definitely feeling they need to get a little more quicker to that ad adaptation. Especially when you don't often go up against a character like a Kirby. I mean, what other weird picks may we seen from Manhattan, though? Donkey Kong, I'd be happy, all right? I really like monkeys. You're you're really harping on this Donkey Kong. Like, yeah. I don't know. Donkey Kong is shockingly uncommon in EGF. I can't remember the last time I've seen one. Like, maybe, mm -hmm. just maybe, uh, the captain from over on Marist. They might be the only ones who zucchini. That's who I'm thinking of. They're the only yeah. one who actually throws out Donkey Kong, which is weird because Donkey Kong was a little prevalent in the early online meta, but it switched towards other heavies like Bowser, like the King DDD we saw earlier. And I don't blame them for that. I yeah. don't blame them whatsoever. Like you saw how good the King DDD was. I'll admit, for good reason, it's real, you know, it's understandable. But. I just really like monkeys. That's just uh, me personally. <laughs> I've just always loved Donkey Kong, so you know, get getting to see it always makes me smile. But you're actually just on the dot. The other heavy characters have just been a lot more phenomenal, especially when you like compare it to characters like Ridley, who I think has just been getting a, a continuous upvote when it comes down to. I saw that. Uh, comes to playtime. It's very impressive to see the, these players always changing up how and when they want to play. <laughs> yeah, as <laughs> we're going to be getting into our next and fourth game right here. And this is where it's really going to be all decided. A-Fly and Cross coming in. Now, A-Fly, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, is probably one of the more consistent players you're going to see. Not just because of their play style, but because of the coverage that they provide with Game & Watch. Game & Watch is a character who forces you to play his game plan. If you don't have that game plan, well, then you're going to be struggling a whole lot more. Game & Watch, you touch a shield, you're going to get upbeat. If you get upbeat, you're probably going to get nared. If you get nared, you might get up aired. You've got to be ready for these situations because they're going to be happening a lot. It's hard to do anything that's safe around this little 2D man. I mean... I'm terrified of Game & Watch. I've Game & Watch doesn't have three dimensions, so that means, you know, maybe there is, like, a small percentage where Game & Watch just dodges your move by just turning sideways, and then you can't see that character anymore. That's the, that's the things that haunt me in my dreams, but 
A game to watch is one of those characters that I think is incredibly unpredictable. Uh, having so many different play styles and having the the randomness of just the, your down special, you know, being able to hit a nine and knock your opponent out of the stage at around 40% roughly, or maybe hitting a four and getting the ice may not be one for one, but still, Game Watch has a lot of opportunities just to kind of switch things up on the spot, and I think uh, a lot of players, you know, thrive on it. Yeah, and honestly though, the side B hammer isn't even the most deadly part. If you haven't seen a Game & Watch play before, you're most likely gonna see a lot of down smash throwing the two hammers down to both sides. Probably one of the best smash attacks in the game, and I don't say that lightly. It's low lag, which means you can just spam it as if it's a tilt attack. Not only that though, it buries, does the damage of a smash attack, and once it buries, you can combo it into forward smash, which is a strong smash attack in its own right, but it's even more powerful considering the fact that it's comboed with another smash attack. It does like 30%. It's like, it's a lot it's of insane. damage. It'll kill you so early. And now, you know, going up against the Robin, the one thing we've got to watch out for is this bucket as well. I mean, I, I've seen Cross do some wicked things at times, especially when you can pick up that book after it's been used. You know, there's a lot of opportunities just for these combos, and uh, the spacing is absolutely immaculate as we start out. A fly is going in, hoping, and well, more now doing an amazing job of these setups. The bomb able to just force out the shield, especially with the key. Having that platform as a safeguard is working well, but I mean, a fly is getting away with just so much right now on the game and watch, being able to get that jump air. Now looking to try and force them, use the bomb solely just to stop them from getting back on the stage, but Cross is gonna be able to get there anyways. I mean, for a character that needs to charge all their attacks, it's even rude that you don't allow them to get a chance. The temple right there, and they fill up completely off of one arc fire? What? If that's a factor in this matchup, oh boy, Cross is in trouble. Because arc fire is such a huge part of the kit, gonna be caught out in the air by the bomb, but... I can't believe what I'm seeing. At this point now, a -Fly didn't get a lot off of that one little uh, interaction. And now they've got to deal with this Levin Sword as they try and get back to stage. Going low with it, that's the kind of read you need, but it's the kind of read that can be punished. Cross needs to be a little safe in the future as they get caught by the down air. Nah, not a huge punished. No, I gotta give that bit of respect, Cross. Maybe off the edge 95% of this game. I mean, look at that already being stuck back into the air. Cross is ready to get any type of smash, though. The grab plus the up, getting that combo, using the bomb slowly to try and stop them out. So much of the recovery is already getting wasted out. I mean, just look at it being onto the half point. A fly moving, go, moving as quick as possible just to be able to push in as much as they can. Unfortunately, Cross doesn't have as much of the recovery for too long. And, well, the zoning from a game and watch, I've never seen it this clean before. Yeah, they are honestly edge guarding to the extreme. And they're doing that because of the low, uh, I mean, the low commitment options that they have. Low commitment is the name of the game for Game & Watch, which we'll get into later as they are looking to put in a clinic right now. But in this neutral, you do, do got to keep in mind, these sword aerials do give you a little bit. I think they could have lived that too, but uh, they just give it up. I mean, it's kind of what you have to do, but still, look. The little choo-choo train fan. They're gonna be able to force that pressure using the bomb to force the shield. In a the moment they feel it's safe, they just go back at it again and work into this game of just forcing Cross to have to go back onto the offensive, but juking the arc fires, throwing their opponent back off the stage, and now just trying to get a big smash. Luckily, that super armor is going to be a big benefit, but the arc fires aren't gonna be lasting too long. Most of them are being hit by the bucket, and look at that, it's already refilled. This may be what you were talking about of how well it'll thrive but with the up air they may not even have a chance because they miss just barely using it yeah the bucket does definitely put cross on notice as oh you gotta notice that arc fire flying across the stage cross was able to get the miracle comeback right there when it looked like all was over and done they were off stage with a full bucket game and watch coming in they had the wherewithal to drift all the way off avoid the bucket and then get a whew, Nice punish right there. A-Fly just wanted to get right back in there to brawl, and that was their downfall. 
I mean, I definitely agree. And we were talking a lot about how a fly was uh, moving in incredibly quick and it was having a lot of control in this game. So I think to see Cross uh, more win out in the end, I think that's a lot given of just, you know, maybe the patient game is what works best, not needing to take full control. As long as you have that clutch factor, that's what matters. It certainly is. Is here and now. Now we've got to start considering what can A fly do different? Like, I feel like fishing for the bucket isn't the answer. And right there, by the way, you could have uh, pressed down and then air dodged up to ledge. Would have worked, would have worked. But either way, that's just something you might not think of in the moment. Yeah. Uh, oh, they air dodged off stage. Oh. That's brutal right there. I didn't even notice that in the moment, but hey, good coverage by Cr Cross as well. Mm. Uh, definitely. Good with that. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, man. yeah, they're right. Our producer was right. A fly. They always are. Oh they my goodness. Always are. I mean, when you're sitting there and you're just watching two people, you're listening to two people talk and you're just watching the gameplay, I, I think, you know. That's just where you're gonna be right most of the time. A fly is gonna have the moment though. Uh, to take a deep breath, come back in and say, you know what? I'm ready to take it home. Though Cross scares me, which is how well they're gonna, uh, they did at least when it came back to the recovery, what type of changes they may go into. Cause they're not looking like they really wanna go for the spells as they did before. Though that PK fire, not PK fire. <laughs> The the art fire. fire, yeah. Oh no, there's too many characters that use the same ability. Look at that Game coverage, fire. though. It's insane. Oh. Look at that. But the beautiful BK fire. The fire manages to set them up. Help me. <laughs> yeah, they're able to ladder them right up with the arc fire. And now, yeah, after that, A fly. I feel like they had such control of the neutral early on. They were going in, they were constantly stuffing out options. Now they're being a little reactive. And Cross, that's exactly what they want to be seeing. Now you're able to get the up tilt, set up a little bit of damage. Game & Watch loves these juggle situations. You've got those disjoints, but you're not able to quite keep yourself in that situation, stuffing out the recovery right there, using your own up B as a kind of spike tool, you're able to get the gimp right there. Now Cross is down a stock after being an advantage. This, oh, well, it's right back to neutral. <laughs> I mean, it's just what Cross is able to do. The moment a flag gets that confidence is walking back in uh, to have some security, it just does not work. Cross says, no, I'm gonna hit you. And then a fly goes on to the aggression. Man, you get a lot of damage in, as I can say, but that arc fire has been one to save Cross from these uh, bigger problems than anything. However, look at that bomb getting the room forcing to the edge. And then once again, forcing your opponent into the air. That's not the game that your opponent wants to play. And there's the setup I was hyping up earlier. You get that down smash and you get such massive reward as now down to full stock and they're able to charge up the bucket as well. Fully charged bucket. They've been throwing it out a little too early at times as ooh, they just get some nice meaty damage right there. Forcing an air dodge with the bomb and doesn't quite get the two frame, but either way, A fly at this point, they have complete control right now. Look at this. This is what I was talking about the momentum, the tempo that we saw earlier, stuffing out every option that Cross could possibly hope to throw out. They are not scared in the slightest. And honestly, to keep up this pace so consistently is the more impressive part when it comes down to a fly blocking out the fire, but unfortunately, not gonna happen too long. What type of luck does Sakurai get this character being able to just barely live out? Though, not gonna live on that stage for too long. Still an impressive showcase to put yourself back on the stage. Yeah, now at this point, it's gonna be the bacon coverage once again. The chef has been such a deterrent for Cross to do anything but recover low in the down tilt. Open up that manhole cover is gonna be the finisher towards the end right there. We're going to another game three. I gotta say, I'm more and more do these players make me question my own skill ranking and yet make me want to play this game more with just how impressive they showed to play every time. We, we talked so much about how Game & Watch, uh, you know, is so unpredictable, so good at most angles in these fights. And I think we saw one of those bigger points. However, Cross 
zone utility, deciding not to really go for these uh, peak, you know, thunders too often though, uh, and rely on the arc fire has been a very interesting strategy, but not one that I say that I've regret seeing. Yeah, I don't regret it either. I, I feel like a fly hasn't gotten the biggest reward off of the bucket. And if you don't demonstrate an option of yours is a threat, then why, why would you change it? Like they've the most they've taken is like 30% once from one bucket. That's the most you're going to get is again. Here is the option coverage I'm talking about down smash into a quick jab on the shield and then immediate down smash. Even if you picked an aggressive option right there, the only thing you really could have done was full hopped right away, maybe, but not holding that shield is going to be punished because you know they were going to throw something out right again. It's uh -huh. it's like a block. <laughs> Block string, I think. I was about to call it a blockchain, yeah. but well, different oh. connotation right there. <laughs> As you have to wait out the entire barrage, but it's not like blocking a Shoto's uh, chain. Game & Watch, again, kind of a wacky, kind of Looney Tunes-esque character. You're not always going to be, it's not going to be obvious when the time to drop shield is. You've got to be very aware of this matchup. You've got to be aware of when it's actually safe. When Game & Watch doesn't have an option to mash because you know that A-Fly is going to throw an option as soon as possible. I mean, you're right. You are very right. However, these players definitely feel, especially Cross, it's going to be looking to make both of us look wrong. Final matchup that goes out. Winner takes all. Not literally, but that's how it feels like as they already start going out. Able to get some nice setup cross still. Playing more into this mid ground using that space. Managing to get that fire, but look at that. The air slash is more than enough. A fly though is reacting much faster than normally. Yeah, this time, like I said, you've got to demonstrate that that bucket is a threat. And they're already filling it up every single time you throw out an aerial that you or a projectile you don't intend on safeguarding. Is at this point you use that Levin Sword to punish that aggressive bucket holding. But hey, that's what you need to be doing. Now, A Fly just barely hanging on. So light of a character. One more hit from that Levin Sword will be it. But that's going to be the stock! Off the corner, too! On a stage with such a high ceiling. That was impossible. And oh, they went all the way in. Sometimes you can just kill off the top with that. It's very rare, but if they DI horrendously, sometimes you can get that kill. But instead, you're going to be the one whose stock is stolen. I absolutely agree. But now, Cross is back inside this spot. Manages to land a beautiful Arc Thunder and then another Arc Fire. Just to force their opponent back. But a fly is getting a lot when it comes down to the bucket. It is now forcing their opponent off the stage. If it wasn't for that slash, that was a possible spike in the possibility. But the bucket missing out just barely. A fly has to respect. Though the spam is there, it's not always going to be there. And well, Cross is adapting to it. Gets the backhead! And now takes the lead for the first time in this series when it comes down to stocks and now look at this just chaining these levin swords across the stage you run low little low on resources so you can't keep up the pressure but either way cross is still keeping control over a fly joining up that arc fire but it's not going to be the stuffer out tool you want to be seeing as Oh, now A-Fly is systematically getting in. They need to get this tempo up that they had in the previous game, but Cross is making it so difficult for them. Yeah, look, tries to go all the way up to the skybox to finish off Cross, but it's just not going to, you're not going to be able to see your opponent. You're not going to be able to land it in the, in the pressure from the arc fires has just been so insane the more it goes out i mean using it every opportunity now not having it they just switch over to prioritizing not charging out the thunder but more just shooting a little bit at a time forcing the opponent but with that beautiful slam up recovery still though cross is able to get back i'm more impressed determination lives in their veins this is perfect coverage from A-Fly right now. This is them in their element. They have you in disadvantage and they will milk it for all it's worth as they're able to more or less escape unscathed from that entire interaction. And now they get the landing there too. But, ooh, a little bit of a grab mishap right there. A-Fly needs to find another way in. If they get it, it could be over in a moment's notice. I mean, 
mean, it's incredibly dangerous. A fly who was taking the series very convincingly, or or just was taking the speed and the momentum. Cross has said, nope, I've always had it. I just was making the viewers think otherwise. Though it gets eaten, Ooh. it gets taken, and that's a load of damage. Almost gets the edge guard, and well, just goes back into the fight. Managing hit in the air, grabs that fire now. Robin's in a very dangerous position until the air smash knocks you high in the sky and they go for the spike! All the way down right there. Demolishing that little paper mache man. Sending him all the way to the Shadow Realm and right here, I've got to say, that was really good mental game to survive all that from cross when you're getting come back on it's hard to put a stop on it it's very hard a fly was bringing it all the way back and cross was eventually able to put a stopper in that oh oh my goodness Killo! this is the first game of, ten of, of, of the whole day for us well, they were already putting on a good sh an amazing show to say the least, and I've got to say, it's been an amazing showcasing on Manhattan. I definitely feel we underestimated them going into this. I do as well as Manhattan. They came to play. Maybe they just had an unlucky series of matches. I can't quite see all of the matches that Manhattan had in their early season. But hey, maybe they just get put up against the top dogs. And now that they have people more around their level, they have time to show that they are ready to claw their way up there, improve themselves, get ready for these playoffs. Because Manhattan has a pretty strong lead. Not impossible to come back from, but Canisius, it's going to be very difficult. I mean, I agree. 13 to 7... Yeah, and with how the matches have been going on, they've been incredibly even. I think this is where Kinesis need to uh, channel in whatever type of show they watch, you know, bring in the main character energy and start, you know, karate chopping people. This is where you start bringing in the Bruce Lee. I'm going to be bringing up a lot of references because honestly, more than anything, I want to see Kinesis uh, kind of more get a better consistency when it comes to securing these kills as well as well being able to live a little bit longer we saw a lot of the times the moment they get that stock they immediately trade and that's not really what you're looking for can you struggle to kind of finish out these fights though you know as we've been talking their players are impressive they play at a speed that i'm not used to but they're not able to keep up that momentum the entire time that's the thing. It feels like they have this on button and they get it. And think of Miko rising. Think of A-Fly. When they had the advantage, they pressed it so far. But when they didn't have it, it they kind of suffered in the neutral. Like, I would think back to A-Fly filling up that bucket again and again and again and then immediately throwing it out. It's not like there's a timer on that thing. You're going to be fine holding on to it, using the threat of it to get a, an advantage. But A-Fly didn't. They just wanted to get back in the driver's seat as soon as they could. And that desire to be in control immediately, that has been the main stopping point a lot of the time. Like, think of uh, Flapjack. They were maybe the master of this style that we've seen, of going in and putting on a mountain of pressure and never letting up. They held that advantage that Kanisha seems to love almost the entire time. However, the rest of them, they were only able to hold it for little bursts. And when they had that burst, they're able to get their zero to deaths. They're able to get their ledge traps up to 180%. But getting there, getting to those situations, that is the struggle for them. Mm. Honestly, I definitely feel we're right on that and it's only going to get more stressful i think the underlining theme of this is kind of breaking through that mistake and trying to kind of thrive above it but when it comes down to one of the last matches you don't really have any more room i think to make those errors and now this is where they kind of have to bring it in i mean having sam sam and e-dog as our possible final contestants it's gonna be a show yeah, now, Sam Sam, different from Sam Sam, a different Cal Captain Falcon player. Um, yeah. 
well, all together. But either way, Sam Sam coming in as the anchor. Manhattan College, all they need to do is not lose too badly. As long as they keep it to like a uh, one two stock and one one stock, they still win. But obviously you wanna keep that point differential up. You wanna make this a stylish win, not just a win. Meanwhile, with Kanishas, who they send it in? Let's see. Kanishas. Oh. Well, we're about to be able to find out. Room. You don't even get a moment to breathe because it looks like they were more than ready to send out E-Dog. And it, that's a Greninja, though. Look at that. Sam Sam, or the way you pronounce it, may be wrong. Who knows? That's not what I'm here for, though. Is already looking to play in that aggression. Two really fast mobile characters looking to take it home as a beautiful kick in the air. Not wanting to go for anything too dangerous. E-Dog does have the better recovery. They still have to trade when it comes down to the air battles. Sam Sam's looking for the knee though. This is the rushdown style that I was calling out Kanishas with, but they're not even able to get in. E-Dog's being completely stuffed out. They're able to get the landing Nair, punishing that aggressive smash attack. But either way, that was only one mistake from Sam Sam. Sam Sam is in the driver's seat right now, and they're not looking to get out. That up smash, it's so safe on shield that E-Dog just chose to respect it. Is now going way off stage. That's what you want to be seeing, but the high recovery is going to stump him. Absolutely agree. I mean, Sam Sam is now looking to hit with these big moves, but they are extremely telegraphed. E Dog has a better time looking to confirm these kills, but gets grabbed, kicked to the side. Just gets back onto the stage, barely misses onto that hit. Sam Sam's not really being able to confirm now. Uh, well, similarly, E Dog's not really able to land these hits extremely consistently. One of them almost kind of landing out though it seems the shield are being both of these player best friends the grab actually committing more when it comes down to these fights yeah is that forward smash on shield oh that's gonna be punished that's gonna be punished big time oh no no, no no there's there's never a punish mm, no as instead they're playing an intricate game of footsies right now intel very like playing around Ooh. So eventually, Greninja maybe a little stronger in those confirmed. E Dog is able to clutch it out in the end. And I think back to how this started out Sam Sam was running away with it, but they couldn't find the kill. And now E Dog is able to just hold on to this stock. They're saving for the winter. Honestly, I just feel it's that E Dog has an easier time confirming these kills at a slighter long range. Sam Sam needs to take control of this fight, but when you have a character who's just as fast as you allegedly, all right, what are you really supposed to do? Outsmart them, outplay them? Uh, yes, all of the above, I'd like to think. However, E-Dog is more than prepared to put you off that stage, and then the moment you try to get back, may have missed input as they launch themselves up, not able to land the counter, and Sam Sam's gonna be able to get back on the stage and convincingly tie things up until that grab starts to look and spike and well they give up that block they give up the edge and they're once again looking to guard or stop very quickly and now at this point e-dog that advantage that they have is starting to evaporate but if they're able to keep sam sam on off stage or on the ledge that'll be great but with that back air well that might have just been a dream a fantasy as that's Stomp is going to put you so high up when you're able to get the landing bear, but then stuffed out by the surprise burst option. No one expects the Falcon kick. Has to play incredibly careful. Sam Sam wants to rack up as so much damage going with what we're used to, at least when it comes to the Falcon and a beautiful parry to solidify, just not really taking the damage. Goes in, goes in, looks for the Mario combo, as I'd like to say. But eventually he's not going to be able to land still, though, in a safe position until that up air, well, up smash, moreover, uh, takes you out, punishes you greatly. And now E-Dog at least puts himself in a better spot, looking to do what the Falcon did before, but not able to confirm it. They meet back into the footsies, and once again, they are just both looking to try and get that edge. But they're not quite able to get there. As Intel, look at this, they're playing around the center stage. We're back to that footsie we saw earlier, but just like before, E-Dog gets the lead in those footsie situations. When they're playing around these full hops, facing these aerials, Sam Sam has to have a huge call out like that Falcon Kick to get in. I mean, you're right, but listen. Call out. When you've got legs like Captain Falcon, you use them. And my goodness, were we not expecting it to end like that? Not in the slightest. Woo!
And I, I haven't been paying attention to their ledge habits, but they they bait an option. They're like, okay, this is safe. Oh, you want to get in and punish me? You want to get in and throw out an aerial? No! As oh. they get that up smash, such a good anti-air. Dragging you down into the second kick, and it's brutal. I love that little dash back. They're like, come on, it's safe. I'm done occupying this space. You're fine. Just come on in and no. Yeah, it almost looked like, you know, the Falcons trying to bait for maybe a side B or down B because uh, you have a lot range and those are very powerful moves that set themselves up. But, you know, the old good bread and butter of just holding your controller up a little and releasing it when your opponent walks in. <laughs> it, it's just too good. How do you beat it? <laughs> Yeah, um, as there, it did really feel like E Dog. I I don't like to call things honorable, but like a lot of players have this idea, this mentality of like when you're playing with good, safe, honest Christian moves, you're able to get these uh like like these trades. But sometimes you just need to say no. You got to put a thumb in it, and you've got to. Go for this big option. You've got to do the up smash in neutral. You've got to do the falcon kick in neutral. It feels like E-Dog is way more reluctant to do that, and Greninja also has less of those options available. And so when Samson goes for that, even though E-Dog is winning in the initial interactions, Samson is able to just upset the balance with these huge power plays. I mean, though, uh, but they're looking to just make that upset. E-Dog had to just try to put themselves down to, to avoid any form of smash, but able to come in, get a little bit of that chip going for the grab, going to be able to easily trade things and putting us back onto the footsie's edge. Not getting the grab, but still looking to just rack up the damage. The knee is what matters the most for the Captain Falcon going for that air. Looking, not going to be able to get that slam or at least up air kick for the Shurikens. Doing a great job of making the space. Doesn't matter that when you get kicked brutally by the down B. Yeah, is that up smash going to be punished this time? You got to at least do it in the right way. But either way, the down tilt might even duck under it as at this point. Ooh. You know, is able to get back here right in with the cleave of the forward air. That has been the best spacing tool that they have. One of the best spacing tools that Greninja has overall. And even though it takes a bit to come out, once you do, you got them in a world of hurt. But they're searching for this confirm and they can't quite find it. These down tilts not getting the answer they want as they get grabbed. Just, oh, it's just a little bit unlucky. I think the grab is being so underutilized right now. We've seen it just kind of set people up and well, Oh, just cleanly guarding Samson from being able to get back on. I was in mid thought, and yet they're able to break the distraction, bring us back into the match. And now we get to see this beautiful combo set up. Poor Samson not being able to get too much stuck, more playing on the low edge, while E Dog is definitely thriving more in the air game. Yeah, they certainly are. Is they're able to get right to ledge now. E Dog is able to get out of that situation. You don't want Sam Sam to get too much um, advantage right off of that ledge. Is ooh covering the neutral tech with that forward smash right there, E Dog. Ooh, where are you going with that? <laughs> You're able to get that up air punished. E Dog spacing around it, and they've kept Sam Sam just trying to get off ledge this entire time. But ooh, just the very end of the toe of the Falcon kick will catch you. Having to be extremely careful. Sam Sam's not in a good position to really go for these big plays, but still has to try and make them, especially when E-Dog's at a similar percentage. The edge guarding is what's more uh, kind of worrying as they end up doing the same thing over and over again, and yet they're forcing each other off the spot, managing to get that low air, and well, now bring us back into the 0% against the big one. E-Dog now wants to go in, look for the air, not able to land it, gets that down. Almost the sneak attack, however, it's just not enough. Uh, Sam Sam continues to lay up the pressure. Ooh, but even that little tricky dash in the air is not going to be enough. You're able to get that ledge up, spacing around the get up attack. Now it's more or less even with one down tilt. This little bit of advantage might just evaporate as soon as you get that. No, the dash tag not followed up upon. These tech situations on the platform are not being covered by E-Dog as now Sam Sam using this little chance they have to get back into the swing of things. They get the up throw. Jogo situation, can E-Dog get down? It's, 
it's more of a question of not get down, but can they get back up? I mean, just look, Sam Sam is making sure that they are just getting, trying to get back off the stage, and E-Dog is relying more on just pushing them, or at least with just a simple neutral, and whatever, look at that. Looking to just mess around the punches, dodges backwards, able to just go for the flaming kick at 101. One mistake will cost it. And it's gonna be brutal right now. Oh, Sam Sam, once again, the up smash is the answer as they're able to get the finisher with that one, send them straight off the top. And with these brazen options that Captain Falcon is known so well for, they're able to dispatch E-Dog and take home the victory for Manhattan College. I'll admit, out of everything, was not expecting the same tactic to work twice. The, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call this game the great debate, you know? Expectations were never there. Everything was always a counter move, but in the end, all it took was just a simple moving forward, jumping back, dodge, and then up tilt. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful writing if I've ever seen one. And think about that up smash. Ooh. Ooh. It's just option coverage. Uh, Falcon has a lot of moves like that that are just very good option coverage. You think they might roll, but you're not sure. You down smash at ledge. You get option coverage. You get covering the roll. Though that's a lot of characters. The up smash is the real kicker. Literally. They get... If there's any sort of... Oh, I think you're coming in. I think you're going to be in front of me anywhere, whether it's up diagonal, right above, or right in my face. You're still going to get punished. And in the end... Captain Falcon, Sa Sam Sam going to carry them home to the victory. And Manhattan College taking it 17 to seven over Kinesis. Not a down moment at all. Kinesis came in kicking, but Manhattan, it seemed their legs were a little bit longer, getting better reaches. And in the end, winning by a solid 10 points. And you know, if there's anything, I think that just shows how Wait, 17 divided by 2 is not 7, but just it, take it take it as it is, how it's almost like it's even, you know, split point of how it could have gone either way if one mistake was, pos was possible on either side. However, I'm more thinking of just the hypotheticals. Manhattan well-deserved, and they showed up today. Yeah, they certainly did. Their victory was well earned, and we're going to be able to ask them a little more about that. As in just a little bit, we're going to get an interview with Crimson, the captain, the Kirby player we saw earlier. So don't go anywhere. EGFC will be back with an interview in just a couple of minutes.
Welcome back, everybody, from the break. We are here with uh, Sandsma Man, the opener for Manhattan College. How are you doing after that win? You know, I'm, I'm, feel, I'm feeling pretty spectacular right, spectacular right now. You know, we've really been we've been on a win streak around, and it can, against such a hard hitting school. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to carry the victory. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty impressive. I mean. I would say your opening was a little bit of a carry. It was like, you know, you know like, <laughs> a little bit. Not, not, you're not oh. I, mean, I use words a lot loosely. <laughs> no, no, no. I get you. I get you. Like you did a lot to really set the pace of this. And how did you feel? Mickle Rising was one of the like big uh, well, surprises coming in at the beginning of this season. The fact that they didn't come on until the spring and then they were that good. And you were the answer. How are you feeling? Did you know what you were getting into going into that matchup? Um, well, when our, uh, our teammates, Rizo has a pocket nest that we usually play against. So uh, I actually know the nest matchup pretty well, and I was able to really use that or really using menu in, in critical situations and having the right options as he wasn't able to actually magnet my critical hitting moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the lack of that magnet being in play was so huge. It really helped set the pace of everything. Yeah. <laughs> I agree, and so, you know, when we're coming up, you know, into this match, especially with the character picks, how confident did you feel, you know? I often, I sometimes, especially when you're going into that third set, I know some people immediately switch on to a different character, try to change things up, and you, you seemed very confident onto your pick, and, you know, does the mindset help? Uh, well, after, you know, leaving Sonic, I've pretty much been on the solo hero grind, is only playing hero. I gotta, you really, you gotta, even like, even if the matchup's even or bad, you always, you just, you can't switch off, especially since it was only one stock loss. You know, if it's a close game, even if it's a bad matchup, you gotta stick with it because it was, it was close for a reason, okay? You just have to get a, a, a little bit better adaption here, a little bit better reads here, and your character can adjust in order to get the win. Hmm. Oh yeah, we know that. And well, now you mentioned you're on a bit of a win streak, but Manhattan did have a kind of rough start to the EGF season last time. So now that you're on this win streak, now that we're into the spring season, how are you feeling about Manhattan College's chances going in trying to make the playoffs? Well, Manhattan College, you know, we did, as you said, we did have a rough start, but as, as we said last interview we did we have been starting to get VOD reviews we have new and up and coming players like Nicaragua as you said and maybe even some potential surprises in the future we are really got some new talent plus with the current VOD reviews from Westchester players that we're really we're really on the rise especially with us watching other other teams you know really trying to analyze what they're doing and what we could do better mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I hear that. And well, with all that improvement, I can't wait to see how far you'll go. If you're already this far on this winning streak, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. But for now, uh, Sansman Man, thank you so much again for coming on and congrats on the win. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Of course. And with that, we are just going to go for the tiniest little break. When we get back, we've got another game coming up as soon as we please. So don't go anywhere. EGFC will be back in just a couple of minutes.